Coming back to English. There's a range of different theories on whether English will retain or lose its status as the dominant lingua franca. Most often, contemplated scenarios contain either the already mentioned switch from English to Chinese, or the continuing domination of English at the expense of smaller native languages. When reading on this topic, however, my attention was caught on the scenario that appeared very different. It came from one of the most renowned linguists of our time, Nicholas Osler. In his book, The Last Lingua Franca, English Until the Return of Babel, he argues that not only will English be displaced as the world's language in the non-distant future, but also that it will not be replaced by another. What Osler suggests is that the rise of the relative wealth of China, Brazil, Russia, and other major political powers sets in motion a global movement towards equality, which will in turn downgrade the status of the English-speaking elites. Personally, I am somewhat skeptical about the statement, especially the growing relative wealth of Brazil and Russia part. But what caught my attention was Osler's explanation for why English will be the last global lingua franca. He states that not so distant advancements in translation technology will enable seamless coexistence of numerous languages in nearly any setting. In this way, the world would return to something of a technology-enabled state of battle. But is this really possible? When I was a student and when Noam Chomsky as a teacher of Nicholas Osler uh, was uh, the most popular linguist uh, in the world, uh, opining uh, on many things regarding languages, it was the time of the generative grammar. Yeah? There was a hope to see languages as shallow structures. There was a belief that there is something never proved to be actually like a deep structure and that the deep structure of languages is a single structure. So basically when you build a tree of, of an English sentence or of a Lithuanian sentence of the meaning of this sentence and to reach the deep structure, the deep structure would be the same so that computers would be translating uh, through the deep structures from one language to another. It was one of the biggest uh, stories of this transformative generative uh, grammar of the second half of the 20th century, but it was based on a pure belief without any proof of the existence of deep structure. However, even with the development of software, it has never worked. And nowadays we have Google Translate, yeah? and Google Translate is basically statistical translation. Okay, you can call it neural and so on, but it is just a large sets of, biling of bilingual texts in pairs of languages, and the computer, uh, the software is just comparing strings uh, of letters in a complete mechanical manner giving us a translation and it works it doesn't work exceptionally well but it works in the past i mean it rarely worked when it was done in line with other underpinning ideas how to translate from one language to another with the use of computers and software a much more interesting thing actually when it comes to technology is speed generation and uh, translating through the use of speech and it is something to be seen yeah? because uh, we as scholars and uh, people who are literate we, we forget that uh, literacy is just another technology uh, of graphic recording of language but in the past, very few people were literate, and nowadays not everyone is literate, but actually everyone is able of speech. And this is a new frontier. And, and obviously, if this frontier is overcome, this could end up with devices uh, you could have, you know, next to your ear and someone is talking in a different language and uh, you can understand what they are talking but there is always a limit of it yeah because
because uh, look, if you use Google Translate, it is pairing around 100 languages, which is quite a respected number, but according to various assessments in the world, you have 8,000 languages. Yeah, So the vast majority of languages is missing uh, from, from Google Translate. Google Translate actually works only for languages with large corpora of written text, written bilingual texts. So Google Translate is translating from one lingua franca to another lingua franca, truly speaking. And if you look at Google Translate from the perspective of this cleavage between Eurasia, where indigenous languages are employed in official capacity, and the rest of the world where colonial European languages are used for the same purpose, you will see that uh, with the exception, I don't know, of five, six, maybe 10 languages, all the languages covered by Google Translate are from Eurasia, which actually is uh, strengthening uh, this uh, cleavage. So I would say technology is mapping out and fortifying uh, this cleavage in language politics uh, between Eurasia and the rest uh, of, of the world. Okay, so just to recap what Tom is saying here, technology may work in favor of multilingualism, except it's the languages that are already prestigious enough that make it to this party. Instead of working towards the reconstruction of the full Tower of Babel, technology might be reconstructing just the top floors of this tower. The VIP lodges with splendid views while in fact doing little to nothing to strengthen the bottom floors. Technology as we use it nowadays is a reflection of economic and power relations as they are now. So when, uh, when solutions are developed like software for Google Translate, it draws at these power relations provide solutions for people who live within this network of power relations and by the same token reinforces these power relations. Let's put it like this. Many people speak Tatar, the language, the Tatar language in Tatarstan, in Bashkiria and other places across the Russian Federation and some post-Soviet countries. I mean, it is around 10 million people, yeah? So it, it is uh, quite a few. When it comes to book production, it is like 40 books produced in the Russian uh, Federation per annum, yeah? When you have a look at Lithuania, there are some like two, two and a half, three million speaking the Lithuanian language. And there are like several thousand book titles published these days. If the Lithuanians had been in the position of the Tatars in today's Russian Federation, most probably 20 Lithuanian language books would be published today. This means that Tatar although being a significantly larger language by the number of speakers, simply does not generate the corpus of written material large enough to allow for algorithms to provide us with translations of high quality. As a result, the quality of Tatar translations will likely come out worse than the ones for even significantly smaller languages in terms of the number of speakers, for example, Lithuanian. And here we bump into language politics again. The only reason for why Lithuanian is supported relatively well by modern translation engines, even though so few actually speak it, to a large extent comes down to the fact that it is the official state language mandated by legislation and quite literally written into the law. There are a lot of materials in Lithuanian which are paired with other languages of the European Union yeah? because Lithuania joined the European Union in 2004 and the European Union has language politics of translating uh, 
all the documentation into all the official languages of the member states, uh, the languages which the member states want to use. Yeah? Because, for instance, Ireland didn't want to use uh, its own Irish language until 2008. So there are such interesting stories. And Luxembourg is not using its uh, national language of Luxembourgish to this day for this purpose. Yeah? However, if Lithuania had not joined the European Union, the position of the use of the Lithuanian language for a variety of purposes would have been lower. Now, just for the record, Tatar is supported on Google Translate. Google algorithms are now capable of translating between a language pair it has not trained on. Imagine the model was trained on translating between Russian and Tatar, as well as between Bulgarian and Russian. Even if it was not trained to translate between Bulgarian and Tatar specifically, AI is capable of doing it, and this is not achieved by simply translating through Russian. Scientists think that these neural networks, which, by the way, are extremely difficult to interpret, are now capable of basic level of semantic interpretation. This means that these AI translators are beginning to translate by meaning, something that many argued machines would never be able to do. There are some interpretations of this that suggest the possibility that these novel and more powerful than ever machine learning algorithms have finally tapped into the deep structure of languages, the existence of which, as Tom has mentioned earlier, is still not proven. Anyway, I get quite excited and carried away when talking about where could technology potentially take us. But truth be told, it already had time to take us many, many places. Internet, for example, has already been around for decades. And studying Internet's language variety is a good way to see how much space for multilingualism there is in the technology-driven world. And the more you look, the more it seems that the Tower of Babel is again not being restored in full. That being said, English is starting to slowly split the pie with other best established languages. You can also look at the content, uh, the Internet content in a given language per head of uh, native speakers, uh, L1 speakers in a given language. So out of sudden, you know, English once again has the highest statistics, but the second language, which I mean, Chinese have very low statistics, yeah, because due to censorship and to so-called sovereign internet as the policy of sovereign internet as deployed in China, people are not that active uh, on the internet. Obviously, they are active outside the internet uh, in mobile telephony, but from this perspective, the ratio of language content on the internet in Chinese to the number of native Chinese speakers is pretty poor. Yeah? The second largest ratio of this kind is actually in the case of Russian. Yeah? Like 8% of the internet content is available in Russian, and it is the second largest, although not so large, if you want, uh, language on the internet, which is obviously a function of the policy of the Ruski Mirs, neo imperial policy in Russia. So you see how choices kind of impact on the reality of the internet or multilinguality or, or the growth or decrease be it absolute, be it relative, of content and the use of this or that language. Look, when the internet was launched at the beginning of the 90s, practically everything on the internet, including URL addresses, was in English, full stop. It started changing only at the turn of the 21st century, when more content was developed in other languages, and uh, there was this kind of uh, symbolic change, like five years ago or 10 years ago, I don't remember exactly, when it became possible to use different scripts than the Latin script strongly connected to English for URL addresses, you know, like Arabic script, Chinese script, Cyrillic, you name it. Still, however, over 50% of all content on the internet is in English. However, 
the content in other languages, but in this quote unquote big languages or lingua francas ballooned. And the content ballooned only as produced in Eurasian languages. We don't have really any noticeable content in non-Eurasian languages. So yeah, it is changing. I mean, <laughs> uh, but, but still, if you look through the perspective of internet content, English is dominant and English uh, remains the meta language of the internet of cyberspace, more broadly speaking. You can do the same uh, looking uh, at the statistics uh, of uh, the 300 Wikipedias in different languages. Yeah? The biggest uh, Wikipedia is in English with the largest number of articles, with the largest number of words in these articles. And uh, when you have a look at other Wikipedias, especially uh, in so-called smaller languages, they use English as the meta language. Yeah? Because obviously when you have Wikipedia in Russian, they use Russian as the language of discussion. But when you have uh, a Wikipedia in Zulu, for instance, they often use English as the language of discussion. So to reiterate, let's return to the original idea of Nicholas Osler, that English will be the last lingua franca finally replaced by multitudes of languages in something of a technology-enabled state of Babel. Does this have a high likelihood of happening? In a limited sense, it seems, yes. From what we've just discussed, it seems that the world just might be tending towards a reconstruction of a fraction of the original Tower of Babel. 